Hi, everyone. Welcome to Forbes Talks. I'm Diane Brady, Assistant Managing Editor here at Forbes. I'm with Emily Baker White, my colleague in San Francisco, who's been covering ByteDance for quite some time now. Emily, what's the latest that you found? So today we published a piece about a fraud risk assessment, a sort of type of internal audit that large companies conduct from time to time um, that was conducted by ByteDance in 2021. Now, ByteDance, of course, is TikTok's parent company, and millions and millions of Americans turn to TikTok every day for their entertainment, increasingly for their news. Some people are even sort of using TikTok the way that we've used Google in the past, right? So um, this fraud risk assessment by ByteDance showed that ByteDance and TikTok um, are not able to be sure that the information they turn over to governments is accurate and complete. And this is is extra important in the context of TikTok because TikTok is right now negotiating uh, a national security contract with the U.S. government. So can can we step back a second? I, I want to ask about ByteDance because the way that they portray the relationship with TikTok is different than what you found through your reporting. So just remind us, you said, of course, it's the parent, it's based in China, so that always causes concerns. But how did it first get on your radar as something worth covering? So I first started covering TikTok before I started covering ByteDance. And what I learned very quickly was that the relationship between TikTok and ByteDance internally is a lot more porous than um, the companies make it seem uh, in the public eye. And so when you join TikTok as an employee, you get a ByteDance email address and your TikTok email address is actually just an alias of that ByteDance email address. I've had um, TikTok employees tell me that they signed a contract to work for TikTok, but their W-2 said ByteDance on it. And so I think what we're seeing here is ByteDance is an enormous company. It's been around for much longer than TikTok's been around. And they've made tons of apps. They've made dozens of apps, uh, even apps that have, that have been present in the United States market before. And to ByteDance, at least initially, TikTok was just another app they made. And more recently, because TikTok became a smash hit in the United States and because regulators started getting really concerned about um, the potential national security issues of having a Chinese-owned app have this much control, TikTok spun off and became its own company. But all of the internal systems that make TikTok work, all of the you know, sort of back-end tools that engineers and product managers are using to make sure that the app is running, were made by ByteDance and were made in China. And trying to disentangle all of those things uh, is really hard. And so to this day, my understanding is that a lot of what makes TikTok run is actually ByteDance in China. Um, and I wrote a big report on this earlier this year. Um, TikTok and ByteDance are actually trying to disentangle their backend systems. Um, they call it something called Project Texas. Um, but that has been a lot more difficult to do than they initially thought. Um, imagine a, a pile of spaghetti, right? And you have to disentangle the spaghetti just in order to sort of separate the data flows between the companies. And and they're separating it in order to not run afoul of regulators. You mentioned the regulators in Washington. I know that there has been legislation. I know there, you know, people are calling it digital fentanyl, you know, TikTok in particular for kids. Is the issue that we associate anything in China with Chinese government, ergo spying, and all kinds of nefarious um, implications of cybersecurity risk? Is that really what's going on here? So obviously ByteDance is, is not the same thing as the Chinese government. Um, Chinese companies do have to comply with Chinese laws uh, that, that say they have to turn over information if the government asks um, or sort of upon request. Now, TikTok says it's never shared information with the Chinese government, nor would it. Uh, ByteDance, interestingly, hasn't answered that question. Uh, and ByteDance does a lot of business in China. They have a Chinese version of TikTok called Douyin, right? They have another very popular news aggregator app in China called um, Chutiao. And obviously, they're, they're Chinese 
apps run differently and have different rules than their international apps do. Um, but I think one of the big questions here is whether either implicitly or explicitly the Chinese government could either ask ByteDance or through ByteDance collect a bunch of information about, about U.S. citizens or dissidents, people who are critical of the Chinese government, um, et cetera, or whether they could use the massive power of TikTok's recommendations algorithm to subtly affect what United States citizens are seeing. Um, and that that first concern, which um, some commentators call data espionage, is the one that has, I think, gotten the most attention in Washington so far. Uh, that is the problem they are trying to mitigate through this Project Texas exercise. But I think the, the other potential for influence is important too. And that's that very subtly, um, they could, ByteDance could and TikTok could change their algorithm to influence what what Americans or Europeans or Australians or anyone is consuming. And frankly, that's a concern that we've had about Facebook before. It's a concern we've had about Twitter and it happens on Twitter right now. I mean, it sounds like a concern writ large about the social media platforms too, but let me get back to the, the fraud risk assessment in particular, because I, I presume, first of all, that uh, this is not the kind of thing that companies do and then hand out to reporters. Am I correct? You know, no, so they do not. Um, so what, why was this Im important in terms of, first of all, they did this risk assessment in response to, I presume the questions, you know, it, it um, take us back a little bit to when this assessment was done and, and what struck you, having covered the company for so long, what it is that really stood out to you as, as, as different or new pieces of information that make us smarter about the company and its relationships? So this was a really meticulous document. It represented a lot of work, probably months of work. Um, it was based on approximately 90 interviews with TikTok and ByteDance employees and a review of a bunch of other TikTok and ByteDance documents. And my understanding was the people who were creating this report sort of went out into the company. They, they were internal to the company, but they went across, I think, at least 17 teams um, to try to learn as much as they could about the company's current practices and procedures and where there might be gaps and where there might be risks, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and what what those folks found was there were a number of sort of irregularities in the typical fraud risk areas, things like embezzlement, um, employees taking kickbacks to do favors for external folks, um, people contracting with, you know, their brother-in-law. That's all outlined in the report, the embezzlement. That's all, the that's all outlined in the report. And, and I have to say, like, that's somewhat normal for any company uh, of ByteDance's size companies should be thinking about how employees might be abusing their systems. Um, at, at one point, the the fraud risk assessment said there are two kinds of companies, companies that know there's fraud in their organizations and companies that don't, right? And so I think um, the most large companies do fraud risk assessments. All large companies should be doing fraud risk assessments. And doing one is actually a sign of diligence, right? Because if you're not doing one, you're just not identifying the problems. Um, but this fraud risk assessment also highlighted a number of risks that were not just about employee embezzlement and sort of regular fraud issues, and that were more specifically about the fact that the company had been built out in and was housing data in China. And so I think those are the risks that made this report different. Um, also, the sort of normal type of fraud risks, uh, it really sounds like ByteDance is behind or was behind when this report was written um, behind other companies of its so size. This was this was a report that was written in the U.S., seen through the prism of a U.S. Um, assessment. Is that correct? I know you mentioned in the story that there was an attorney who's no longer with ByteDance, because I would assume in China that this is this would be an unusual exercise. When I think of a fraud risk assessment, I think of it as something that certainly U.S. public companies would do, but this was done basically as almost a U.S.-based exercise to see 
how these frauds look in a U.S. context, or was it essentially, um, do we know whether it was done by Chinese personnel, you know, out of China? The risk assessment was regional, mm -hmm. so I don't know what other fraud risk assessments ByteDance has done for other regions. This one um, was specific to ByteDance's businesses in the Americas and in Oceania. Okay. And so those were the markets uh, where where the company was doing an assessment. It, it wasn't just U.S. law they were concerned with, but uh, they were certainly concerned with U.S. law. So, you know, when I go back over your bylines of the past few months, Emily, with TikTok and ByteDance, what, you know, give us a sense of what have you learned? Are the concerns that we're hearing out of Washington justified? Because I mentioned it earlier, you know, the digital, and it's all from the usual social media concerns to potential espionage. Where, what do you think when you look at the landscape right now, um, you know, are these concerns justified? Are regulators um, getting a piece or are they actually stepping up their concerns in response to the information that's coming out? That sort of thing. Well, I think TikTok poses a new problem for U.S. regulators, and it's likely not going to be the only time this problem arises. But so far, the social media apps that have taken our country by storm, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, have all been homegrown. They they were all you know, they came out of the United States. They're U.S. based. Their executives are U.S. citizens. Uh, that That's not true for TikTok. TikTok, of course, ByteDance is based in China. ByteDance still owns and controls TikTok. TikTok itself is based, um, I believe, in Singapore mm -hmm. and has employees all over the world. And so um, for the first time, there is an app that is a smash hit that is on everybody's phones in the U.S. that people consume for hours every day uh, that isn't a U.S. based, it isn't owned by a U.S. based company. And so I think a lot of the concerns that folks have about TikTok, they actually have about the other social media apps too, right? The idea that people would be addicted to social media, not a new idea. Mm -hmm. True for Instagram, true for Facebook. The idea that these algorithms could influence elections, could influence, you know, public health, things like that. Again, not a new idea. Happened on YouTube, happened on Twitter, happened on Facebook. But they all have this additional question now about the fact that this company is controlled by a foreign company. And it's not likely to be the only time. Like we've been in a little American exceptionalist bubble that we haven't encountered this question already. The rest of the world has because they had Facebook and Instagram and you know Twitter and the others. And so I think the idea behind Project Texas, the sort of exercise to separate TikTok from ByteDance and make sure that Americans data stay in America and only are accessible by a small team of U.S. employees. I don't know if that's going to work because at the end of the day, for now, those people still report into people in China. And until that stops, I think there's a sort of structural problem with the separation. But the, the idea of figuring out how to make sure that governments who are suspicious of each other can still host apps based in other countries is a problem that's going to come up again. And mm -hmm. so one thing that TikTok has said um, and and that I think a lot of people have said is that like if they can solve this problem, if they can get everybody comfortable with some sort of system where they separate out different regions, everybody else can follow that system and that can actually be like a functional way forward. The question is whether TikTok and ByteDance can do that to regulator satisfaction here in the EU and other places. And I think the, the jury's out on that. Do you think TikTok's likely to be banned? I mean, does that seem like such a, a stretch of the imagination that it's really not a realistic conversation? I don't know that it's a stretch of the imagination. I guess for the reasons that I just pointed out, I'm not sure it's the smart way to deal with the problem, right? Because like, it's not that TikTok is uniquely scary or problematic it's that there is this there there's a whole class of apps that are foreign owned right be real is french owned we don't talk about that as much because we don't have as much tension with the french government and it's you know a, a democracy um but 
Th this question will keep arising of how we make sure that we safeguard people's data and make sure that they're not being influenced by foreign powers through the through the media they consume. And so I guess like if you want to ban TikTok, you could do that, but it doesn't answer the larger question of how we should be handling that issue. And how regulators in general worldwide, frankly, should be handling these social media sites since, as you mentioned, U.S., uh, you know, we were the we were the originals, right? Going to other countries with the technology that we have. Anything else on your radar right now, Emily? I know you've been looking at this for quite some time. Do you continue to gravitate toward ByteDance as as the company to look at right now versus TikTok, which I know technically, you know, we could think think of them as one and the same, but it seems to be really fertile terrain for stories. I mean, ByteDance is a huge company that does a lot of things that I don't cover at all. So I really, I, th I think of myself as covering TikTok and ByteDance's TikTok business um, more than more than I think of myself as covering their their other apps, which are sort of wide ranging. Um, I sort of fell sideways into even covering TikTok. I, I did one story and that story, as sometimes happens, led to another story, led to another story. And and here I am now writing a lot about TikTok, right. but um, a lot of people spend a lot of time on the app. And I think when we sort of look at what we should be covering and what what is the best use of our time as tech reporters, going where the people are does make sense to some extent. And as TikTok continues to gain power and sort of drive culture and and civic conversation and commerce in this country like i think i think it should be covered so that's why i'm focusing on it great more to come thanks very much emily